everybody, this is Alyssa Chiu. I am the founder and CEO of Anchor Taiwan. Welcome to the Women in Venture Roundtable. We have been an ecosystem builder since 2017 with a firm belief that community and capital are important tools for cross-border innovation. In addition to our Women in Venture initiatives, we also have tons of other ecosystem events around corporate venturing, around founders connections. Feel free to check them out on various social media channels. Just put in Anchor Taiwan. And today, this is our 12th Women in Venture Roundtable. We started this about two years ago, and so far we have connected over 100 female investors, mostly based out of Taiwan, with spotlight speakers sharing their experiences and expertise, hoping that we can bring more diversity, investment opportunities, and different perspectives into the ecosystem. Today, I am really excited to welcome Grace Chow, principal at Felicis Ventures. She will share with us a lot of her current experiences, as well as her experiences before at Walmart, especially around corporate innovation and corporate venturing. Before we formally start, I would like to welcome Terry Tao, the chairperson of Semi Taiwan and also global CMO of Semi. And we're going to do a quick lightning round with him, with Semi being one of an important supporter with Anchor Taiwan's Women in Venture series since end of last year. Terry, for the audience who are not so familiar with Semi, can you share a little bit with us? What does Semi do? Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Terry. Uh, Semi is actually is the global semiconductor and the microelectronic industry association for more than 50 years. Uh, our uh, headquarters uh, is located in the uh, Bay Area uh, in the United States. And the uh, global footprint uh, we spring around the world, such as uh, Europe, Japan, uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, and Southeast Asia. Uh, our goal is to facilitate the industry healthy growth with the prosperity. So uh, that's our mission and the goal. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, um, last year or even the year before with TSMC being the global center stage of, you know, from trade war to automotive industries and everything. This is definitely something that I think worthwhile for a lot more investors, especially from Taiwan, to pay more attention to and also to utilize. So, Sammy, it seems like, wow, like a very deep tech kind of um, organization and um, area. Why did you decide to support a series like Women in Venture? and with Anchor Taiwan? I think uh, semiconductor is the foundation and the enabler for every innovation. I think no matter it's a hardware, like a, a notebook or mobile phone, but even nowadays, all the applications like uh, Uber or Facebook, they all need a data center to do the, all the computation. So uh, semiconductor is the foundation for every innovation. And uh, recently uh, for semi, we not only to uh, focus in the mature or big enterprise, but we take more initiative about how uh, the mature, uh, the corporate uh, can support the startup. And also we have some like a corporate venture uh, event. And of course, uh, in the long run, we also uh, want to encourage more female gender diversity uh, to uh, devote it into the uh, high tech related industry. The high tech industry not only limited to do the double E, but how like a corporate venture, right? The female can also make a good investment to nourish the uh, a very potential uh, uh, new startup company can change the world or change our daily life. So uh, we want to uh, support. Uh, we have the uh, share the sound common value like an anchor or a Lisa to work together. So being in Taiwan, I think definitely get in touch. And I am sure that if we want to find you, either the annual conference or a lot of other events, um, hopefully we'll be able to get in touch with a lot of your activities in the future as well. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, thank you. Now, I guess we are going to get ready for our main session. Grace, are you ready? 
Hey, hi, everyone. It's such an honor to, to be here. And I'm just so grateful to, to get to know you all. Um, and grateful to Elisa for, for inviting me here. Um, hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Um, just realized there's a typhoon too. So be safe, everyone and, and really appreciate you joining today. Thanks, Grace. And I think uh, we have read your bio, very impressive career so far, especially, you know, like coming from Taiwan and basically moved to Silicon Valley with corporate venture experience before and now with one of the biggest venture funds in Silicon Valley. Would you like to tell us in your words, just a little bit of your background, your upbringing, what brought you to what you are doing today? Sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Taiwan, born in Taipei. And I moved to the Bay Area with my family when I was 10. Um, but then I went and moved back to Taiwan with my family when I was in eighth grade. And I finished um, high school at uh, NEHS, Xinzhu Xian Zhongxue, um, the Shang Yubu bilingual department there. Um, and then after I graduated high school, I came back here to the Bay Area and went to uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and, uh, you know, after I graduated, I did two years in investment banking focused on technology M&A, and then went in-house to Walmart, um, where I worked on a lot of projects around corporate development, um, strategy, innovation, and in investing. Um, was there for, for five years and then decided to come and do early stage investing. And, you know, I've been at Felicis for um, a little over three years now, um, early stage fund seed through Series C, around a billion dollars under management um, and investing across all sectors. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my high level career background. Great. So we're going to unpack each of those major, I guess, milestones in your career. I know that you have been named um, top 10 women to watch in VC by, I believe that's Wall Street Journals and Forbes 30 Under 30, obviously a lot of tremendous achievements so far in your life. And, you know, I think in the end, I would love to ask you why you think you were on those lists. But before we get there, why don't we cut into it right away? Uh, a lot of our audience today actually come from, um, some of them are pure VCs, but we also have quite a few friends from the corporate venturing side. And previously you were with Walmart and specifically for their corporate development. And I think it's very interesting. Well, first of all, for those audience who are not so familiar with say, for example, their structure philosophy with Walmart, can you give us a quick kind of like overview in terms of how they structure this part to bring in more innovation to ensure that they stay relevant? Sure. Um, so the reason I decided to join Walmart was, you know, after two years doing technology M&A, um, I realized that I really wanted to learn more about like beyond the transaction and brokering the transaction. Like how do companies acquire other companies? Like why do they do that? Right. Like how do they think about innovation? How do big like, companies leverage innovation coming out of Silicon Valley? And wh why Walmart really fascinated me was because you know, Walmart being the world's largest company, like $600 billion in revenue. It's actually the largest employer in the US with 2 million employees. And when I was at Walmart, I learned some stat around there is one Walmart within 10 miles of 90% of the US population. And so dig into Walmart's customer base, and you have a reflection of what America generally looks like, right. And so but what drew me to it was really, uh, beyond it being a really large company, uh, it also had a lot of appetite to do digital and tech information, um, uh, sorry, innovation. And at the time when I joined, there were already like thousands of engineers in Silicon Valley, working as part of Walmart's technology hub, very focused on e commerce, but really thinking about the future of consumer experiences, right? So like this group thought about uh, everything from e-commerce to supply chain tech to robotics, AR, VR, ad tech, enterprise software. And so when I was there, um, a lot of the projects I worked on was really around helping Walmart figure out what the overall corporate strategy should look like. And then from there, figure out, OK, what are some of the inorganic growth opportunities uh, to adopt and also to adopt new technology innovations, right? So um, at Walmart, um, the, the, the team was very much much structured that, you know, the, the corporate development team I was on um, 
uh, was had the mandate of doing uh, all acquisitions, uh, investments, partnerships on the e-commerce side uh, globally. So I got to work on uh, probably a dozen deals uh, in the US. I also went to China, India, and worked on a lot of divestitures, partnerships, investments there, um, and also just did a lot of projects, bigger uh trying to figure out how do we bridge the innovation coming out of Silicon Valley with the Walmart leadership that really sits in Arkansas. So that was a lot of Walmart, like Walmart startup demo days and, you know, uh, startup pilots and partnerships and, and things like that. Fantastic. And I want to get into a little bit further details, especially around maybe two things. One is you mentioned that basically with this corporate structure trying to get, I think the keyword, two keywords, at least I'm hearing is one is global. So they're looking for really the cutting edge thing anywhere. So I would love to actually get into a little bit of discussion specifically with your experience with those interesting deals with China and India. And another keyword that I'm hearing is inorganic growth. So this external innovation that a lot of corporates are trying to figure out to get from either startups, external sort of like um, inspiration to really kind of like um, make them stay relevant. I would love to also get into a little bit of that as well. Let's start with this. So as far as I know, uh, a lot of companies, you know, like even though they uh, say that they have, um, you know, corporate development, a lot of time it means different things at different companies. Companies. So at Walmart, do they mainly focus on M&A or do they also have like a CBC arm? How, how is that like over there? And then, you know, for early stage, you touch up on a little bit. How do you, let's say if they don't have a formal CBC arm, how do they still like, or how did you at the time over there facilitate some of the connections? You mentioned Silicon Valley. How, how did you actually facilitate for that to happen? Yeah, so uh, the way Walmart is structured, there's no dedicated CDC fund. And so, you know, our corporate development team was actually pretty small and mighty. I think we had like three or four people. And so it wasn't like a super structured thing. And it was great because it allowed me to jump into a lot of different types of projects, um, strategic projects as well. And um, when we did investments, you know, Walmart didn't do that many minority investments. I worked on probably the first minority investment that we did in, in China. And but it was a lot of acquisitions. It was a lot of strategic partnerships with other large businesses, with startups, um, and then, you know, investments. Uh, occasionally. Walmart also had, I think it still does, um, an almost like tech incubation arm called store number eight. Um, and that's where they're like trying to build out uh, and test some new innovative concepts. Like there was um, AR, VR, right? Uh, there was like IoT um, and just like or like voice shopping, some of these like new technologies for what Walmart thinks like might drive the future of consumer experiences um, and that it might want to incubate. Um, so there was an arm like that. And then Walmart also had um, kind of like an in-house uh, incubation team kind of informal but that incubates brands within walmart you know and so you know as like retail we saw the rise of direct-to-consumer brands um kind of circumventing retailers right like now that brands can really uh, develop uh, direct relationships with customers um and so walmart had acquired a bunch of brands but also uh started incubating a lot of its own brands internally as well so um those are some of the, 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 the teams um, relevant to your question. Yeah. And I think later on, I think for sort of like the second part of your career at Walmart, you were also instrumental in their media business. So retail and media, I think, you know, like a lot of people probably were like, huh, why? Or yes, that totally makes sense. Um, can you share a little bit in terms of their rationale, what you were seeing over there? Do you think it's a great, stra great strategy? So that, you know, like maybe we can take some lessons for, for the retailers here in Taiwan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, when I uh, took on the role of uh, kind of going over to, to Walmart's media business, it was still fairly um, nascent. Um, you know, I think at that time, Amazon already had probably like a 10 15 billion dollar advertising business and I think I'm trying to remember what it was for Walmart but 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 
you know, much, much smaller. And, you know, they had outsourced a lot of it. And so the mandate was really like, hey, can you come and, you know, I was chief of staff to the GM and helped build out like the long term strategy for Walmart's media business. And we really wanted to think very creatively, right? Like, how do we think beyond traditional advertising? We really saw it as creative storytelling alongside our suppliers, right? Like what Walmart um, had a, a lot of um, was a lot of like valuable data on its customers, right? That bridges, e-commerce, uh, physical stores, you know, all through all of these channels. Um, Walmart has just so much data that is so valuable for a lot of suppliers. And so how do we work together with our suppliers and think of new innovative concepts to do creative storytelling to marry commerce with content in new creative ways. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, worked on the strategy there, built, helped build out a team. Um, and yet yeah, now, like, it's a very, very large team within Walmart. And, you know, it's a very blossoming advertising business, which is um, really cool. And I think still has a ton of potential. Fantastic. I definitely would love to also see more of the developments around that as well, especially from big retailers uh, in Taiwan. And I think this is great inspiration for us to think more about. Another thing that we touch up on is your experience, especially with deals in China and India. So you work on quite a few uh, pretty high profile deals. And I'm just curious, you know, like uh, maybe if you can share a little bit of backstories or your actual experience working on them, their rationale at the time, the reason and you know, like for a big corporate like Walmart, how did they actually go about, especially on the cross-border basis? Uh, why did they actually choose this way? Sure. Um, so, you know, while, while working at Walmart, I think it's, it's very interesting because you're seeing both, you're developing overall corporate strategy at the high corporate brand level, yet you also realize like retail strategy is not one size fits all markets. And so you see how you have to adapt to very different markets, right? Like from the UK to China to India, etc. And a lot of it ended up being a lot more nuanced. And so in China, um, I worked on the divestiture of Dian, Yihao Dian, I think it's called, um, in, in China to Jingdong.com. We also worked on a large strategic partnership with Jingdong and ended up also investing in a company called Dada, I think it was Dada, quite the, which was like O to O last mile delivery platform. And, you know, I think what was really interesting at that time was um, many, many large players from Amazon, eBay, Uber, all tried to build uh, organically by themselves, like in China. And then I think all of us realized like, you know, China is a very different market on its own. You really need to understand consumers there. There's a lot of local considerations. You need the support of the government, et cetera. And so um, I think it was also Uber who had the same strategy of like, hey, let's divest our business, partner with one of the players there and, you know, find synergies and really build our businesses together that way. And so that was what we did in China. And then after that, we were like, okay, let's figure out what we want, what we should be doing in India. You know, um, Walmart didn't have really an e-commerce presence in India at that time, um, or even stores. I think there were a lot of like small-ish corner store formats at that time. Um, and you know, I went with the CEO to uh, to India, and at that time, we were trying to figure out. Everyone was saying India was just years behind China, right? And you know, the e-commerce market was was really blossoming, and how the consumers there are really, really just skipped desktop and went straight to mobile, right? And so did a lot of studying of consumer behavior and demographics there. Um, didn't end up uh, pulling the trigger at that time. We decided to wait because we felt like India at that time was actually a little further behind what people had said uh, or research reports had said about the, you know India versus versus China. But ultimately, I think it was a year or two after I left, um, Walmart did end up making an investment in Flipkart uh, in, in India, which was cool to see. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to, to just be able to learn how um, retail strategy uh, is is diff uh, it has to be thought about differently with different business models and understanding of consumers and markets in very different um, localized regions uh, for, for one retailer. 
Great, thank you. And I, I guess with all of those experiences uh, with Walmart and now also, I guess, uh, with Felicis Ventures, before we move into that, uh, on this topic about the future of retail and also perhaps um, the future of consumer experience, kind of like to put it, put it in a more maybe like human-centric way, what's your view in terms of what, what are some of the key points that we can keep in mind, especially when it comes to finding the technology or developing the trends um, when it comes to this? And, and if you have any thoughts specifically around, given that you spent some time in Taiwan, if you have any thoughts specifically for, for Taiwan, feel free to share with us as, as well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I just know the U.S. market a lot better, and so I can I can talk about the the U.S. market first. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of very interesting things happen happen in retail. I think, um, you know, e-commerce penetration was continuing to accelerate, but I think with COVID and the pandemic and everything, it's really accelerated that penetration by by many years. And it's it's really um, I think cool to see to see that happen. So both on the demand side of you know people are now very very used to ordering like groceries online now, right? And a lot of that behavior I think is really here to stay. Even you know, hopefully, when when things get better and, and COVID and the pandemic eases, and on the supply supply chain side, I think um, there's been just a lot of um, new perspectives and understanding now. Of like, we now see what happened to our supply chain when there was a big disruption in labor, right, due to the pandemic, and so now we're seeing a lot of opportunity for you know startups in like. Uh, manufacturing robotics or supply chain automation, like right now is their time to shine because a lot of these, you know, large manufacturers or companies are their timeline to adopt some of this new technology has also accelerated. And so I think it's a really interesting time to to be observing um, retail in the US and I think globally as well. And then I think more broadly too, um, in the retail landscape, um, we're continuing to see like just an explosion of new tools across the whole retail tech stack. Um, you know, now I think, you know, with Shopify and, you know, you can, you can see Shopify is actually an, uh, a Felicis uh, portfolio company too. Um, but, you know, a ton of new startups across, like if you're a brand today, it's, it's very, very easy to launch and scale with products that you can use for marketing, for merchandising, for supply chain, for logistics, and just plug and play. Um, but on the flip side, what we've also seen is there's a lot of competition now and brands in the U.S. Um, really have to now figure out, like, how do you really differentiate your products, you know, build authentic community with, uh, with your customers, and also be able to find scalable customer acquisition channels that goes beyond Facebook, Instagram, dominant social media platforms, because it's so easy to start up a brand now, right? So you, you know, in any category, you'll see like dozens and dozens of, of very similar brands. So, you know, now I think it's, it's easier than ever to start and run a small brand, but I think harder than before to really create a breakout brand or type of company that like a VC would want to back, right? Like a billion dollar um, company. Um, and then lastly, as I talked about, I think the um, other thing that um, the other trend is going to be around like just new consumer experiences. There's more and more startups um, that are either driving the future of like voice shopping, conversation AI, um, live streaming. I know it's really big in China and Asia already. Um, but, you know, I think some of these new formats will be also um, interesting to, to observe in our big opportunities here in the U.S. Fantastic. I'm at least at least I'm hearing two keywords that I think are very relevant for us. One, you touch up on all of this uh, supply chain related, uh, either you know like logistic, automation, robotics, IoT. Definitely, as you mentioned, worthwhile for a lot of Taiwanese players, investors, and also founders to think more around this, especially on a global scale. Another thing that I think will uh, bring us into the next topic beautifully is you know like through as competition gets more and more fierce. Uh, whether you have the capacity to build authentic communities, I think that's the word that you use, is really the key for you to differentiate. And also that's kind of like a very important way to connect, I guess, with your stakeholders as well, which is really a value that we believe in here at Anchor. Mm. With that, 
Yeah, I want to make a segue into what you are doing now as an investor at Felicis Ventures. First of all, I think、uh, for the audience who are not so familiar with Felicis,、uh, we'd love to actually、uh, hear from you in terms of a little bit of intro. Especially, I remember that when I was doing research, I was very impressed by this core value that they embrace to invest with empathy. What does that mean? And maybe even kind of like, can you give us a bit of backstory? In terms of how Felicis Ventures was started, yeah, sure. So,、um, you know, quick history and background on Felicis. We、uh, started more than a decade ago, a billion under management,、um, investing out of our seventh fund now,、um, and we're a generalist fund. So we invest across all categories, across seed through Series C.、Um, so we invest a lot in consumer and enterprise, fintech, healthcare.、Um, Real estate,、uh, even more frontier categories like, you know, drug discovery, computational biology,、um, climate,、uh, synthetic biology, things like that.、Um, you know, over the last、uh, more slightly more than a decade, we've had ten IPOs, eighty exits,、um, I think thirty seven unicorns valued at over a billion.、Um, and so, some of our notable investments include Shopify, as I mentioned.、Um, Uh, Credit Karma, Warby Parker, Flexport,、uh, Dollar Shave Club, Twitch, Canva in Australia,、um, Notion, Warby Parker,、uh, um, among others.、Um, we have a pretty global and、uh, diverse.、Um, Scope when we look at companies. So I think our companies right now operate in like 15 plus countries, and our founders come from more than 40 countries.、Um, you know, Felicis,、uh, our founder, was started the firm very much wanting us to be to be different, right? Like, and I think especially with what's happening now, there's abundant money、um, in venture capital、um, in the U.S. Like to to founders, in, in many ways, I think. People say here like money is cheap, and you know over the last few years we've actually、um, been、uh, Dasha, our head of founder success, has been running、uh, an internal survey and just working with our founders to figure out like what are things that would. Actually, matter to you, right? In terms of how you build your business, like there are tons of venture firms that are offering just like a long list and menu of portfolio services. There's a lot of that already, but like what we actually learned was, hey, like. Being a founder is so hard. Like, think about the the personal, the human side of building a company, right? From, you know, we invest starting from ideation, the seed. At every stage, there's so many challenges, and it's such an emotional roller coaster. We think of our founders almost as professional athletes, and athletes have coaches, and you know, and so. We decided to launch something called the One Percent Founder Pledge,、um, which means that we actually gift founders when we first invest in a company with our first check. We'll gift founders one percent on top of that、um, in non-dilutive capital, so it comes out of our own management fees. And founders can use this money for anything related to their founder development and wellness. So. Founders as you are using it for professional coaching.、Um, we have founders even using it for therapy, CEO circles, and you know we measure something、uh, called founder NPS internally.、Um, our portfolio services is actually called founder success, modeled after customer success,、um, and、uh, you know it's just very much part of the the values and the ethos of of, of how we invest. We want to be the investors that you know will be in the trenches with you and、um, You know, really think about in, you know investing with empathy and in, in the human side of investing. That's fantastic, and I think it's probably still relatively rare, especially for investors in Asia or founders in Asia as well, to have this kind of benefit. Actually, one of the companies that we invested into recently hired a coach, so I'm also very happy to to see that and to see that. A fund actually put that as their mandate to really kind of like support their founders along the way, and I think this probably、uh, has a little bit of maybe relationship with how Felicis got started. You mentioned that I guess you know like the fund was a, a little bit、uh, over ten years old, and I love the story about how the original founder. Started this.、Uh, I re- I remember you mentioned that he was kind of like an early、uh, Google employee, and then afterwards, can you share a little bit, just in terms of kind of like back then, how this whole thing got started? 
Yeah, sure. I think he shares this publicly so I can talk about it. But, um, you know, he uh, he was an early employee at Google. I think he was one of the first product managers there. And um, he was really interested in, in venture capital. And, um, you know, he is an immigrant from from Turkey. And actually, um, you know, most of our team, uh, we have a very diverse team. We have a lot of immigrants on the team, very different backgrounds on the team. But, you know, at, at that time, this was, you know, a, a decade ago, uh, you know, he, um, I think probably just didn't look like a typical venture capitalist, right? Like, you know, nowadays we still have diversity issues within VC today. Like, you know, uh, like there have been many very few women investors, it, you know, was it's still largely dominated by white males. And think about it back then, it's, it's very much even more so, right. And so, you know, um, he very much set out to be to just say, like, you know, I want to build something myself and make it different. Um, and, you know, uh, so I feel like the whole, like, hopefully the team, we have this almost like chip on our shoulder underdog mentality of, um, you know, we don't look like the typical venture capitalist. I don't look like the typical venture capitalist. Um, and I think that has really helped us to be able to um, succeed and identify founders better because I think we inherently have less of a bias issue because our team just organically is very diverse. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. That's great. And I think that diversity, I always believe that that's kind of like the roots of innovation because you actually bring different perspectives. You probably can right. identify different uh, investment opportunities. You are able to connect and maybe kind of like win the deals with some of the, you know, like um, founders that would um, basically feel that their mission or their values are aligned with what you believe in. So that's that's great. I want to dig into a little bit in terms of your own sort of like investments and focus at Felicis. Can you share a little bit with us, I suppose, with your experience with Walmart, uh, you know, consumer experience related, retail related, probably, or still a huge part of what you do, but just kind of like uh, more details in terms of what excites you and, um, you know, examples in terms of your recent or previous deals uh, can be interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a generalist investor. And so I invest across all categories. And I think what was great about the Walmart experience is while Walmart is definitely retail, but because Walmart is so big, it touches so many industries. And so while I was there, I spent a lot of my time looking across healthcare, supply chain, fintech, basically like, you know, a lot of a lot of different industries. And so, you know, really started to get a better understanding of like, what are some of the gaps, pain points in all of these industries? And so at Felicis, I think the way I think about my themes and in investing is, and I generally try to keep this broad because my scope is broad, but I invest in businesses that are reinventing um, the way we live, ranging from, you know, how we shop to how we work to, you know, our health to, so it, it, it's, it's very broad. And so some of my, my investments you know, I've actually done a few in healthcare. So I invested in a company called um, Trial Spark, um, which is uh, reinventing um, the space of clinical trials, right? Like today in the US, it takes a very long time to get drugs to market because clinical trials are such a bottleneck. And so Trial Spark really uh, is able to light up doctors' offices to be able to power clinical trials when before they couldn't. And so now consumers have more access to be able to do clinical trials right or I also invested in a company called Sprout Therapy um, which is uh, kind of reinventing uh, the autism space you know in the U.S. today um, I'm not sure about Asia and Taiwan but in the U.S. Um, there are like two million kids with autism every year and it takes 18 to 36 months to diagnose and place them into care today. Um, and so Sprout, um, you know, they're actually one of the fastest digital health companies in the U S now they've raised like um, probably like close to a hundred million dollars after we invested and are growing just tremendously fast. Um, they have a technology platform that can better bridge 
therapists with families. And so now families can get placed within weeks, right? And so reinventing what health looks like, what families look like. And um, let's see what else. I've also invested in a B2B gifting company called Sendoso. It kind of has a a retail angle too, but um, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of e-commerce is in B2B and B2B commerce is like uh, almost like a hundred billion dollar market or, or something like that. And, you know, there isn't a scalable way for companies to, um, to do that at, at scale today. And so, you know, Sendoso is another one of those examples, but yeah, you know, overall I um, invest across all sectors. Um, my most recent investment is a series A investment in a company called voice flow. Um, that's kind of a uh, design and collaboration platform for designers to create voice apps and um, uh, conversation. And so it kind of comes full circle because when I was at Walmart, I worked on the first um, strategy for voice shopping and like conversation commerce. And back then the technology stack wasn't built yet. It was very hard to to make it a reality, but fast forward to today, the tech stack is so built out. And what we're missing is that critical tooling and design layer. And so voice flow, will really make, you know, what I had envisioned for Walmart seven years ago, a reality today. And so I think it's just really cool to see um, some of these things uh, come for full circle in my career. Awesome. I am also curious in terms of because you mentioned all of this very exciting deals and also ideas that you come across that you supported. Uh, can you share a little bit over there just before we go into Q&A? Usually, how does it work? So you go out there or people come to pitch you and then like over there, is it kind of like, okay, I am going to endorse this company. I believe in this. And then you become kind of like um, the internal supporter or champion with that. Or do you go through kind of like an investment committee? How does it work um, over there just on a general uh, basis? Yeah, yeah. So um, we are, we get, we definitely get a lot of deal flow, but we also do a lot of outbound. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of trying to figure out different trends in different industries, reaching out to different players, ranging from technology startups to larger incumbents to like figure out the dynamics, you know, of, of an industry. Um, and so I do a lot of outbound, I would say a lot of the companies I invest in are from, you know, direct outbound, uh, or, you know, like, like warm intros, but through just doing a lot of homework and and, and reading in the space and understanding competitors, but, you know, process internally, Felicis has a pretty small team today, the team of, I think eight, uh, eight right now. Um, so everyone has a lot of autonomy. We are all free to source and bring in whatever deal at whatever stage. We're also very flexible. We lead as well as partic- participate. And so um, the the like playing field is, is very wide. And so I've been able to really kind of pursue uh, just whatever I'm becoming more more curious in and, and, and passionate about at, at the moment. Um, and for us internally, like we make decisions as a team and we have a voting structure um so you know if you are the deal lead and you're very very passionate and have a lot of conviction over a deal you can really pound the table and um you know and and the team is also with our voting structure everyone kind of brings forward their concerns and and uh like different pieces of the puzzle and you all try to get to that that place together but um yeah overall like our decision process is uh you know, we're, we're early stage. So most of the time you're, 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 you're really trying to make decisions with very, very limited information. And so it's always a very healthy uh, and an intense debate at times. Thank you. With that, I think um, just to make it kind of like a first circle back to what I mentioned in the beginning with you kind of like being named with four 30 on the 30, you know, top 10 women to watch. I know that you have been so humble and down to earth ever since the very first moment that I have um been lucky enough to get to know you but I also would love to kind of like invite you to share a little bit with us especially with a lot of other aspiring female investors here in the room as well what do you think what was the quality um, that you have or what did you do so that you know like you basically are able to really bring this incredible part of yourself into the world and have all of this uh, achievements Um, just like maybe some suggestion or advice for our, our audience Thank you. Well, you know, I think I'm really humbled by uh, some of some of the recognition. And, um, you know, I think, like with with a lot of these awards, it, 
it comes from um, just re referrals from people that I've worked with before, founders, um, and and so I'm just like super grateful for them, who like the people who are willing to to to, to do that for me, and you know, especially in venture capital, my success is built upon like my founders, right? Like they're in some ways doing all of the work and, you know, I just have to pick the right ones. And so um, I think it's a combination of just having worked with really, really good managers and, and people who, you know, like, for example, at Walmart, I was usually the the youngest person around around the table of executives. But, you know, I worked with amazing managers who, you know, gave me the exposure, gave me a seat at that table. And, you know, I think um, if I were to think of advice, I always think of, I think, success is very much, um, you know, a, a little bit of, you know, some some luck and some preparation, right? Like, being able to have people who give you the opportunity, but then you also being prepared to take the opportunity. And so, you know, in a lot of, a lot of times in my career, I was always kind of anytime there was opportunity to, to do something new and risky, or like, different or out of my comfort zone, I generally like raise my hand to do it, right? Like, Grace, do you want to go to India with, with our CEO? We have no idea what we're doing there, but do you want to go? Um, yes, I, I raise my hand, right? Like, Grace, I don't know what, we're, you know, we don't know what we should be doing in voice shopping. Um, and I'm not sure we have a strategy. I raise my hand to just, just you know, do this super scrappy pilot with some like janky device to try to, to, try to figure out if we can get some data, right? And so, you know, I think, um, uh, like, I think I owe, I owe just a lot to just really great people, um, that I worked with who, you know, uh, being this, like the youngest kind of bright eyed, bushy tailed, very idealistic, optimistic. And why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And having people be receptive to that and, 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 you know, continue to help me grow. Um, it's been just something I've been really grateful for. Thank you. Really, really inspirational. I think, you know, um, I believe that not just for myself, but also for our friends in the room as well. With that, I'm going to open the floor and invite our friends to jump in with your questions. So what I'm going to do is that now I will allow you to unmute. And given that we have a room full of investors, what we're going to do is uh, you can raise your hand with this reaction sort of like a little emoji thing in the bottom. And then uh, we will try to call you and then you can unmute yourself, introduce yourself a little bit and ask your question. Oh, I can see Abby from Headline Asia, previously Infinity Ventures. Nice. Uh, so I'm um, happy to be here today. And this is very inspirational. Thank you. In Headline Asia, we're known as Infinity Venture and uh, basically a Japan-based VC firm. And um, we... We co-brand with eVentures um, two months ago. So now we call like headline. It's a, like one big family. So we have funds, independent funds in um, Asia, like headline Asia, headline, uh, in Europe, headline Europe, and also in the US. So um, we also did Sprout. So um, I think- Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, in terms of the sector, like um, it's quite similar with like what you're looking at. So, um, and I'm like personally spend more time on like Southeast Asia region and as well as Taiwan, of course, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia. And um, so for, for me, like I'm curious, like you mentioned like Albon research and you also look at deals in, the, in Asia and Southeast Asia especially. So I'm curious, like, what would be your investment thesis? Because you also um, you also talk to funders in the U.S. and in, you invest in um, your portfolios would be like, I guess most of them are like um, Americans or like in right. the U.S. Yeah. So I'm curious, how do you align your investment thesis of U.S. deals? with your like album research in like Southeast Asia or in Asia in general? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and so, you know, while Felicis, we are a journalist fund and we invest across stages and also across all geos, like we still just have to focus and, and manage our time. And so, you know, um, our strategy has been we 
focus primarily in the U.S. So most of my research, my outbound work, all of that is in the U.S. But, you know, internationally, we have already made investments in um, some winners in different markets. So, for example, Canva in Australia or, you know, Shopify in Canada, Adyen in the U.K., uh, in, in Europe. And so a lot of the new opportunities we end up investing in um, end up being like founder referrals or um, in uh, opportunities that just come out of those networks that are already there. And so we're not like proactively trying to do, you know, a ton of research to like map the whole world. It's much more like, okay, let's figure out how do we focus. And then for some of the areas that, you know, we're not as close to, how do we leverage existing networks or build relationships with local experts to almost like automate some of that, right? And so that w- that's, that's been very much um, our, our strategy so far. Thank you, Grace. I also see that Tin also raised her hand. Hi, uh, I'm Tin. Actually, I was a financial investor and now changed to a uh, CBC side. So I have two questions for you. First is, what is the biggest difference you can see comparing with VC and CBC? And uh, second, uh, when you was in Warma, I believe that you do some strategic uh, investor for uh, investing for the uh, Warma's uh, continued growth. But now you change to such as early stage uh, uh, startup investing. I'm curious that how you evaluate the early stop, uh, early stage startup because they probably don't have product yet. They probably just have the idea. And how could you really evaluate, say that, okay, that is a right startup we want to invest? Yeah, really good question. I guess on your, on your first point, um, I think there are many different, CVC structure differently and you know I'm curious to at some point like uh if, if folks can share uh you know how how your guys' CVCs are structured but you know I think I think in the U.S. um you know I've seen some 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 CVCs where the strategic um uh like scope and areas they invest in um, need to be very strategic to the organization, right? And, you know, sometimes when they make investments, it's it's different from like a, a standalone fund, there's more kind of strategic considerations that have to tie back to the original organization. And so a lot of times it can it can be be structured structured differently, I think. At the early stage, you know, I when I first came over to to early stage investing, um, it was definitely a few things I had to get used to and learn. It's, you know, when I was at Walmart, when I was in banking, you're making decisions based on a lot of information, right? Like usually probably too much information. And then suddenly I come to early stage and you're trying to make uh, bets and decisions um, with very, very limited information, and especially at the seed, sometimes we do pre-seed, it's just an idea and and, and founders. And so um, I've like really had to, to get used to that. And then the other thing I have had to get used to is uh, rethinking how I think about failure, right? Like, because I think for my whole career, even from school to now, like, I think I'm someone who's very hardworking, I'm very ambitious, I've always gotten good grades, and like failing as a concept um, is just you know hasn't been something that like you know now like i'm an early stage investing failing is part of our job right like if your startups are if you're investing in startups that aren't failing then it means you're not taking enough risk which means you're not a good investor and so like learning that has been something that that i've had to learn but i think generally um you know now when i when we invest when i invest um it depends on the stage because i'll do seed i'll do series a i'll do series b and i'll do series c occasionally and you know the later stage it is the, the more data i have with respect to looking at their their traction customers and things like that but you know at the seed i'm really looking for like founders that have really unique founders market fit. Maybe they come from the industry or they don't, but they have some really unique insight or unique advantage that speaks to why they're the only ones that can build this business. Um, and, And then besides that, I'm just looking for like really big markets or really big like non-existent markets that if everything were to go right, could, could just be massive. Right. And so, um, you know, I think it depends on the different stages, but but that's that's how I, I I try to find find my companies and think about things. Well, I guess to embrace failure is probably kind of like hard lessons that we all are going through as well at different sort of like yeah. stages. 
you know, without life. And I see two more hints, and I think we're going to power through those two before we get into the investor circle. First of all, I see Flora from Spot Labs. Would you like to unmute yeah, yourself? Thank you. Ask your question? Thank you, Eliza. Hi, hi, Grace. This is Flora um, from Spot Labs Taipei. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it was a great sharing. And um, at Spot Labs, we invest in a lot of the... Uh, early stage companies from a lot of the AI or uh, AR, VR tool, softwares, B2B services till very end consumers like just uh, like cloud kitchens to some e-commerce uh, solutions. So my question will be like, uh, given the uh, the COVID situation and from, from uh, since last year, everything changed and the, everything moved online. I'm just curious uh, uh, when we uh, do the, Valuation or evaluating startups. Um, is there any changes about your process? Uh, whether it takes longer or or how how what are the meetings or our form? And because you know back then we we will have a lot of the in person meeting or even dinner lunch to 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 observe the the founders and how how he interact with his teams. A lot of the things are offline and now everything's moving to online. So I'm just curious about how great you guys are doing um, and how you guys evaluate founders and look into more about their, their person. Yeah, that is, that is such a good question um, because, you know, I think, um, you know, at least here in the U.S., like VC activity has actually been very, very high over the last year, even with the pandemic and, you know, even with doing everything via Zoom. I think it's just a combination of just a lot of money, you know, in, in the in the industry. And, and I think also people realizing that we can do things over over Zoom, right? And, you know, if you talk to, um, you know, I, I talk to my VC peers and everyone's like, wow, with Zoom now, I'm actually so much more productive. I no longer have to like, um, commute between coffee shops, you know, all day and like meet people. And I think especially for from some of these like first founder meetings, um, you know, to be able to do that over Zoom, you can just like turn through so much more, right? But I think, you know, in my opinion, I think, you know, before backing companies, it, it is still important to like meet meet the founder, right? And because I think there's so much that's not captured over Zoom. And, um, you know, we're always looking for magnetic, magnetic founders, founders who can like hire, who can like just really have that, that energy. Right. Um, but I think process wise for us, you know, we've gotten used to doing things over zoom and when we couldn't meet founders, it just meant that we ended up doing a lot more founder references. And so that includes, you know, a lot of back channel references. We're just doing a lot more homework, to try to understand like, who is this person that we're talking to? Um, and so, uh, yeah, overall act activity definitely has not flowed down, but people just had to have to make some, some adjustments, I guess. So I guess, you know, like uh, get to know your co-investors and also a lot more other people in the in industry could be helpful so that when you need yeah. to do the reference check, you know who to call. And I see more and more hands, but we have very limited time. So I'm going to take one <laughs> last one. And then, you know, like during the Q&A or later on um, during the round circle, if you you can quickly also uh, ask your question then as well. But now we're going to take one last question. I see Gavian, you know, each session with Uma Inventure, we usually will reserve 20% of seats for some of the other male investors who support us as well. So Gavian, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, <laughs> hi, I thank you, Alyssa, and uh, thank you, Grace, for impressive sharing today. And uh, I work for United Daily News as a CBC, so I'm uh, more curious about what your experience in Walmart. And uh, may I ask, did you have some experience that how did you deal with the uh, difference between your CBC department and the business units? For example, if, uh, for example, you have very different trend vision, you, you believe one thing is going to happen, but they don't think so. Or uh, you, you like one team, but they like another one. Uh, but at the same time, you think the, 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 the other one team they love, the, the team they love, in your mind, it's rubbish. How do you deal with this sort of difference? <laughs> um, very good question, uh, because I think at, at Walmart, I was always trying to work with very different business units. And 
you know, different personalities and, you know, maybe you experience too, but oftentimes, especially when you talk to like engineers or like tech leaders, they're always like, I can build this. We don't need to partner with anyone. We don't need to acquire, like I can build this. Right. And so uh, I think what we tried to do um, a lot of was like one really try to come up with almost like a, some source, some core framework or like source of truth. So we did a lot of like build versus buy versus partner analysis, right? And, you know, if we can come up with a kind of share, shared set of priorities as it relates to like, how fast we would be wanting to go to market, like what, what, what types of, you know, valuation or types of technology that, you know, what can we accelerate and things like that. There's, there's some ways to try to find alignment, you know, with the business, business owners. Um, and then, you know, the, the other side of it is like in Corp Dev at Walmart, we aligned mostly to, to Walmart e-commerce CEO, right. And the CEO is the one defining the strategy. We're working on all of that together. And when a strategy can be built in a way that um, flows effectively down, then I think the whole organization gets just like a lot more, more aligned, um, I don't really know if that that answers your question, but you know, it was definitely like a, a you know a struggle to to get everyone aligned, and I think that's just kind of a reality of a of a large corporation. Thank you, Grace. So much insight and so much wisdom from you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience and your perspectives with our community. And with that, we're going to end the first session of our Women in Venture Roundtable. For the investors in the Zoom, we're going to go into the closed door investor round circle. So stay tuned and stick around. And for our audience online, uh, thank you so much for watching this and for joining us. Our next event is going to be in August, featuring the VP of Kickstart Ventures. We're going to talk a lot about impact investing and also CVCs. If you're interested, feel free to RSVP to get the recording or join us. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you.